podcast is part of the Sports Social Podcast Network. Hello and welcome back to Humans of Speedway. I'm Ian Brannan and in this episode, we're looking at one of our sport's most valued supporters. We're all excited to see some British Speedway getting back underway once again. The speed and the danger are some of the aspects that make the sport so thrilling to watch. 500cc bikes with no brakes hurtling into corners at 70 miles per hour is a fantastic spectacle. But what happens when Speedway goes wrong? Riders know full well the risks they're taking in their careers and for our enjoyment. Accidents in Speedway will always happen, but thanks to better safety equipment for riders and air fences, these are often relatively minor. However, unfortunately, heading into this season, there will be some riders who don't know it yet, but will find themselves injured and sidelined for a period of time. No Speedway means no pay. Riders usually get paid per appearances and per point. However, for riders in British Speedway's leagues, we have the world's only charity for injured Speedway riders. The Speedway Riders Benevolent Fund, or the Ben Fund for short, exists solely to offer support and assistance to Speedway riders who've been severely injured whilst riding for British Speedway teams. Sometimes the support can be short term, but as we know all too well, lives can be changed permanently as a result of injuries gained in the sport and sometimes these injuries or other health issues can even present themselves long after a rider has retired. In this episode, we're going to find out more about the Ben Fund. We'll speak to rider Mitchell Davey, whose life was changed in a split second when he was critically injured while riding for Birmingham Brummies three years ago. The Ben Fund sprang into action and took away some of the immediate financial worries and helped his recovery. Mitch is repaying that support with a charity bike ride later this year, which we'll also find out more about. And we'll speak with the chairman of the Benevolent Fund, Paul Ackroyd, a former FIM referee who now oversees the charity and ensuring those who need it get the right support as quickly as possible. Plus, we'll speak with a fan doing his bit to raise awareness and funds for the charity. Roddy McDougall is a former TV journalist and executive and once was head of news at GMTV. He's written a book called No Breaks about the sport charting the last 12 months when very little happened, but exploring how Speedway can make it big again, with all of his royalties going to the Benevolent Fund. Let's start then with your story uh, Mitch, because this was a meeting that I actually attended. It was the only time I've been to a Birmingham Brummies meeting and I was working in Birmingham. I was doing a show on the radio. I finished at seven o'clock at night and I got there as soon as I can. I got in late and I think I got in about the third heat or so. Um, your crash happened in heat five, but what was your day like otherwise? Because I think this is the thing with Speedway. You don't know that your life is going to change in an instant as you head into a meeting, that you're not going to be going home in your van with your family. You're going to be going to hospital in, in a very critical condition as well. Talk us through how that day started, the 9th of May 2018, um, if you can take us back there, Mitch. Uh, yeah, thanks Thanks for having me on the, on the, on the podcast. Um, yeah, so it was just a, a sort of a normal day like like any other. Um, I'd raced at Swindon on the Monday night. Um, you know, had a had a had a uh, average evening. It wasn't wasn't great. wasn't wasn't worst either. Um, you know, I got up the following morning. Uh, took my wife to the airport. I had to come back up to Glasgow to go to work. Um, my parents had also just flown in from Australia, so um, went back washed my bike um at uh, the place where nick morris and dave blago kept their bikes um yeah woke up the following day loaded the van um set, set off to birmingham just um because I was, I was staying in the cotswolds with my parents at the time um so yeah just set off set off for the uh for the meeting like any any other day um it was the yeah, the, my dad was obviously coming to, to work for me at the same time. Um, and yeah, it was a normal day. Um, only, only thing being different was uh, I was testing a new clutch setup in the meeting. So that, that was the only thing I was just looking forward to, to trying. Um, it had been something that I'd spoken about with Nick Morris the, the previous day and uh, he'd just give me something to try. Um, and yeah, sort of went into the meeting like any other um you know it was a it was a really nice day the track was great um had a little bit of dirt on it but nothing too extravagant um yeah 
had a great first race. Uh, went out and won it, and I think set set the quickest time of the, of the year um, in that race, and then was confident going into my next one. And uh, yeah, I uh, made an average start, um, but got to the first corner in front. It hit a bit of grip, and I knew at the time I wasn't. If I tried to ride it out, I would have sort of buried myself hard into the fence. So just took the option to to lay the bike down. And uh, yeah, after that, uh, the first thing I remember is waking up in intensive care with uh, Kev Dillon speaking to me. It was one of those rare crashes where all four riders go down. And I think you were just the unfortunate party that was at the bottom of the pile. And I think, didn't you get hit by a bike? I think that was what, you know, really gave you the most damage. Would that be right? Yeah, that's what um, that's what we think it is anyway. Um, you know, from the pictures we've seen, um, I've got the video, um, so I've I've looked at it all uh, a good amount. Um, but yeah, I think I think the damage was 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 a bike at the end of the day. Um, but yeah, that's what we looked at, it and it was it was a proper proper freak accident. You know, for the for the first part, I shouldn't have slid off. Um, it was one of those almost like a first bend bunching situation because it, you'd just come out of the tapes it was the first bend actually the second turn where the where things happened sort of midway round that first corner uh, and if one of you had gone down it would have been a completely unremarkable incident you, you'd have got up and carried on what happened was there was a couple of problems with some of the other riders in that particular bend and one thing led to another and all four riders went down all four bikes went into the the fence and unfortunately you were just uh, just at the bottom of all of that yeah that's what i've like from watching it back um i i hit a rut got got grip laid the bike down um sam bb who was off gate one he hit a bit of grip um, and it lifted um, and he let go of his bike, which took out Josh Bailey and Callum Walker. And it was then, I think all three bikes met, met me at the fence, I guess. It was quite a shocking moment. I've been going to the Speedway for as long as I can remember and I've never seen an accident quite like it. And I think it was just the silence that fell across the stadium. You know, this huge roar, the first lap, the bikes just come out, the starting gate, full revs, and then to nothing, you know, in a couple of seconds. And we could see that one rider was uh, at the bottom of that pile. And I'm not sure we necessarily knew it was you at that moment. But we also saw three other riders get up and walk away, uh, which I know that Sam Beebe, I think, was was injured uh, a little in that um, in that incident as well. But then the work on you continued. Multiple ambulances and paramedic cars arrived to assist. And you were down on the track for... 45 minutes or an hour and I think anybody who's been to the speedway knows that if a rider is down for that long then it's a serious situation that we've got on our hands and it, and it was a, a a race to save your life on on the track that the paramedics were faced with there yeah that's what um you know I can never thank the paramedics you know enough of what they did you know I, I spoke um a lot with them after after afterwards um but yeah um at the time, obviously, I had no idea what was going on. Um, it wasn't, you know, till a couple of days later when, you know, you started getting filled in on all the small things that had gone on as well. And I think this was the, the, the thing that sticks with me as much was the, you could just tell the concern on the other riders' faces and, you know, the people who were around. And um, I think it might have been Leon Flint, and uh, I remember him walking past the stand um, while the work was going on on you, and you could just tell that there was, you know, that this was serious, and 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 this was going to be whatever happened, you know, this was going to be a life changing situation for you. Yeah, that's what um, Leon and I were really close at the time. Um, obviously, his first season in uh, in in the national league and in British Speedway, um, so. You know, we'd had a really good bond going. Um, and, yeah, that's what he said He said to me. Like, he messaged me uh, afterwards and said, like, you know, I wasn't allowed to, to scare him like that again. And, uh, yeah, that's what, uh, you know, we've, we've, you know, I guess we're probably still still closer than ever just because of, I guess, that in a way. But, yeah, that's what just, yeah. from And then I think Leon was a bit of a, bit of a hero like trying to spur the boys on you know to to lift it all their heads and to you know when the meeting was going to go on and uh make sure that uh, they got the win 
Your teammates did rally together, though. 37-34, the final score. The meeting was abandoned because of a time curfew in the end, but uh, the Brummies did rally together uh, to get the results. And uh, there was another accident further on in that meeting as well with uh, Jordan Jenkins, who uh, was injured, and that was the, the cause of the, uh, of, of the meeting being um, abandoned, but the result did stand. Your injuries were very severe. Um, some large rib injuries. You got a punctured lung you received uh, injuries to your vertebrae, um, torn ligaments as well, and uh, also broken a shoulder blade, which experts, according to reports at the time, said was almost impossible to do. It was a long road to recovery, wasn't it? And what were the, 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 the weeks and the months like after we saw the ambulance disappear from the stadium? Because it was a long road to recovery that uh, that you were on there. Yeah, that's what, it, it took a lot of time, that's, that's for certain. Um... You know, I spent two weeks in hospital in Birmingham um, and then was released, allowed to come home. And um, I was, it was at my dad's birthday um, that he was over here for. So um, we went out for dinner and um, I was struggling at dinner, struggling being able to breathe. So ended up going to uh, the doctors the following day and, uh, yeah, ended up having to get my uh, my lung drained. Um and spent another week in hospital up here. Um, and then since then, um, you know, it was a matter of time, like letting the bones heal first before I could do anything. Um, starting physio again, um, getting gradual movement back in my shoulder and uh, my lower back. And um, yeah, at the same time, building up my lung strength again. Um, and that, that's something that, you know, I still, during the colder months um, over here, I still struggle with, you know, my lung tightens up. Um, you can constantly feel it, you know, especially if you're out sort of exerting yourself. But, um, yeah, that's what, it It had been a long journey. Um, I got back on a bike at the, the end of 2018 um, and went for a ride at Birmingham just to get it out of my system. Um, and at the time, you know, um, I felt all right on the bike, but I knew I definitely wasn't fit enough to, to race again. Um, so I just, I took a year off, um, you know, help Craig cook and, um, and, you know, now I'm getting back to, to fully fit. Um, you know, everything feels a bit better, you know, you can do more cardio work, um, and things like that. So yeah, it's, it's a gradual process. Um, but yeah, that's what. Um, yeah, I, f- I feel now that I'd be fit enough to get back on a on a bike if I wanted to. And is that the aim? Are you are you heading back onto uh, onto a speedway bike again, or or has has your life moved on now? Do you think, or what's the what's the long term plan? Um, I've still got my bikes. Um, I still look at them. I still say, you know, should I have another go? Should I not? Um, but at the same time, you know. I'll, you know, it's been a couple of years, um, you know, could I, would I be at the same level I was at, you know, could I get back to that or, you know, go better than, than what I was? I, I don't know. Um, but yeah, I, I sort of look at life with a bit more of a grown up head now than, uh, just, I guess, wanting to race my bikes all the time. Now, when a major accident occurs, that's when the Speedway Riders Benevolent Fund leap into action. And upon hearing about this crash uh, at Birmingham, the Speedway Riders Benevolent Fund provided all the support that uh, they could really to Mitchell's wife, Donna, and uh, Mitch's uh, wider family. Uh, and, and, and two, the, uh, the, the Speedway community in general got together and there were collections at the stadiums as well on, on Mitchell's behalf. Chairman of the Speedway Riders Benevolent Fund, Paul Ackroyd joins us now. Uh, Paul, tell us about the work that the Benevolent Fund firstly uh, provided for Mitch uh, after his accident, but uh, but also uh, to the wider Speedway community as well and, and the kind of work that the Speedway Riders Benevolent Fund do and why people's donations are so valuable. I mean, I mean Mitchell's case is, he, Mitchell is not unique. Um, there have been many others in similar circumstances uh, to Mitchell. Um, what normally happens following a fairly serious accident is we are alerted 
through the Speedway network of the promoter or the team manager or, or something to just say, hey, there's, there's been a really nasty incident and, um, you know, this is what has happened. So our, imme our immediate sort of help line, if you like, is, is to the partner or wife of that rider. And it's inevitable that they're always two or 300 miles away from where the accident is. Um, so, for example, Mitchell was in the Midlands and his wife or partner was, was up in Scotland. And um, so our main aim is to make contact with with uh, the partner and and to just make sure that they're OK. They're normally hurtling down the M6 or the M5 or the M4 to some hospital or other. And we, we need to just organise a little bit of help and make sure that there's a hotel there somewhere near to the hospital where where the rider is in and we need to make sure that um, they have some money immediately to enable them to survive and and get through whatever is going to be thrown at them over the next few days so we have a, a kind of a little bit of an emergency plan in place that we're able to do that instantly and um and so that is how we operate in, in such circumstances. And Mitch, back to you. Tell us about some of the help that you received from the Speedway Riders Benevolent Fund, because I know that uh, it was really special to you and, and, and really appreciated. But just give us a, an idea of some of the support that you and your family got. Yeah, that's what, um, you know, at the time you, you're immediately out of work. You know, all your income has, has ceased. You've still got bills. Um and like, you know, like anyone and, uh, you know, they, they step in and just, just relieve that pressure. Um, you know, and the other thing that the Ben fund done that, you know, probably would never be heard about or noticed would, would be the support that, you know, Paul himself offered to my wife while she sat by my bedside for two weeks down in Birmingham, you know, she was in a strange, strange city, um, sleeping in a hotel and spending, you know, 12 hours by, at my bedside every day. Um, and the support and, you know, just, yeah, everything that they offer, it's, it's a full package and, you know, riders, you know, can't be thankful enough. You never, you never want to obviously have to call upon it, but you know, when things do go wrong, they're there immediately, you know, no, no questions asked. They're, they're there for us. I think maybe what fans perhaps don't realise is, and, and I've, I've noticed this over the last year or so of, of doing podcasts when, in Speedway and speaking to riders, is the amount of expense that a Speedway rider has, not just obviously your day-to-day -day bills as being a human, you know, a mortgage or car or whatever else, you know, credit cards and all these kind of things, uh, feeding your family, all that kind of stuff that we all have to, to face is... Firstly, how sometimes how hand to mouth Speedway can be, depending on who you are as a rider, um, and and you know needing those points, you know those points, uh, obviously feed your family, um, but also the cost of Speedway is quite high as well. In you know you've got bills to pay for your engines and all this kind of thing too. So financial worries are are a big thing in in Speedway. Oh, massive, massive. That's what uh, you know. It's. It it's something that you know you you sort of go through your season and you don't plan you know anything going wrong you know you you know how much you got to score to to make ends meet and everything everything like that um so yeah when it when it all goes wrong um you sort of left going oh god what happens now um it's 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 a it's a weird situation um but yeah the the expense of being a speedway rider is probably ridiculous now um and you know it's it's so hard you got you have to be at the top top level i think to to make money in the sport for everyone else it's it's a meeting to meeting basis hoping that you you clear some profit to to make some money I think in the previous episode of this podcast series I spoke to Nikolai Clint and he worked out that it costs 50 pounds a race for a rider to, to just turn up 
And so obviously, if you crash, you know, that's, uh, I mean, you know, you need to be successful as a rider to, to pay that back <laughs> even before the tapes yeah. go up. But, you know, uh, if, if you crash, obviously, you've still got various bills still to pay within the sport as well as everything else. Yeah, that's it. You know, you, you crash and you bend a bike. You are, you know, potentially a couple, uh, maybe a thousand pound down straight up. Um, and you, and the worst thing is it cannot be your fault. It can be a freak accident or anything like that. Um, you know, I go back to my crash. Um, my body took all the damage. I think the only thing I did was I, I ripped a grip and broke a front mudguard. And that was it. It was, but you know, on other, other hands, you know, you could just come together with someone in the first corner. Um, you could be looking at a new, new forks, new diamond and new front wheel, you know, if something goes wrong. And back to you, Paul, just give us a little bit of a, a potted history of, of the Benevolent Fund, because it's been running for quite some time now. Where, where does it all originate from and what's the backstory? Um, well, firstly, the, the Ben Fund was formed in round about 1947, 1948. And it was started by a guy called Sir Arthur Elvin, and he was the managing director of Wembley Stadium at the time. So he ran the famous Wembley Lions. And during that period, there had been a few fatalities and some very serious accidents resulting in um, the riders' families um, being lost from income and because in those days uh, the NHS didn't exist. And so he decided, along with a couple of other fellows, that we should have a charity in Speedway to try and help riders who had fallen on hard times. And so the the charity was formed with an income of just over £6,000. And over the years it's kind of evolved from that, um, to where it is today, um, times have changed and circumstances have changed and the level of accidents have changed as well. And um, so the Benevolent Fund here in the UK, um, which is the only Speedway Riders Benevolent Fund in the world, I might add, no other country has what we have to offer. And um, you people talk about how good life is in Poland but they don't have a charity that looks after injured riders like we do. Um, so it's evolved now to, to where it is today. And um, we, we try and look after the paraplegic riders that have been injured racing here in the UK. And we try and look after riders who get fairly seriously injured um, racing for a British club uh, in a normal season. You're listening to Humans of Speedway. I'm Ian Brannan, and that was the voice of Paul Aykroyd, chairman of the Speedway Riders Benevolent Fund. We've also got with us Mitchell Davey, who was a rider who's certainly had their support over the last few years after having an appalling crash back in 2018. We'll hear more from the both of them very soon, including plans for Mitchell to do some fundraising to help repay some of that generosity that's been afforded to him by the Benevolent Fund. We'll hear more about the work of the Benevolent Fund from Paul Ackroyd. I will speak to uh, Roddy McDougall, who has recently written a book all about Speedway and how Speedway can get itself big again. We'll hear from him because he's donating all of his uh, proceeds to the Speedway Riders Benevolent Fund. So there's the charity angle as well. Still to come on Humans of Speedway. Welcome back to Humans of Speedway. I'm Ian Brannan and it's a Ben Fun Bonanza in this episode because we're shining the light on a very important organisation within British Speedway and something that British Speedway is unique in having, its own charity to help those uh, riders who have been struck down by injury in the line of uh, taking part in the sport with a British club. And we're joined by Mitchell Davey, who's already told us about his story and, and how he ended up needing the help of the Speedway riders 
Business Benevolent Fund. We'll hear more from him very soon because he's doing his own charity fundraiser later this year. And we've also got with us Roddy McDougall, who's recently published a new book all about British Speedway, which is raising money for the Speedway Riders Benevolent Fund. First, though, back to the chairman of the Benevolent Fund charity, Paul Ackroyd, who himself is a former FIM referee and has overseen many accidents, I'm sure, in his time, which we'll talk uh, more about. But the work that the Ben Fund does is is not always reactive straight away to an accident that's just happened yesterday or earlier this week. Some of this work can be required for an ongoing period of time because unfortunately some riders do suffer life-changing injuries and some injuries bring themselves to the fore even long after a rider has retired. Yeah, what what we really find is is that riders muddle through their careers and they get the broken legs and the broken arms and collarbones and various other things but when they stop racing one of the key things probably three or four years after their retirement is that they have big problems and one of the key characteristics is is like nerve damage and there are many riders or retired riders today who are still undergoing treatment for injuries that happened four five six seven years ago and and they run into problems in in dealing with that both because they can't work or they can't work properly and they don't get the help that they need and so the benevolent fund steps in there and and tries to help them as much as we help riders who uh, break a leg or an arm or whatever during a season who who can't race for three or four months we, we particularly look after those but we're finding more and more um, that riders who have retired and three or four years down the line they can't work properly because of injuries occurred by speedway racing and do you find now that it's talked about more riders coming to you with maybe uh, mental health issues as well further down the line because particularly when um, say a rider has been used to being involved in the sport and perhaps with injury their career is ended at short notice you know that can be a whole other thing to deal with for them as well that you know the sport they love being a part of has suddenly you know vanished it it, very much so Um, there's no fix for the adrenaline that the riders get when they're racing and when they have to stop that, um, they a lot of them have a big problem, a big issue with what can they do to substitute that, what they experience racing speedway. And yes, uh, there are several riders who find it very, very difficult. And the mental health side of speedway racing is, is coming more and more to the forefront over the past few years. And uh, only this year we've we've helped one particular rider, a retired rider, who um, has experienced quite a few problems, uh, mental health wise, and uh, we've we've been trying to coordinate and assist him um, to make sure he gets the right treatment. But there's no fix for the riders once they stop racing, and it's it's a big deal for a lot of them. And the last year, of course, has has not been great for Speedway, but particularly the Benevolent Fund relying quite you know, largely on on bucket collections and, and and events like that to to raise money. But your work has has still continued. Tell us about how the last year has been for the Benevolent Fund. Well, we were very lucky because we were the only meeting to take place back in March, uh, March fourteenth. Yes, yeah. and. Uh, so we can count our blessings very much although the the attendance for that meeting was very much affected because people were very worried and they didn't know what you know what what was to come from this covid this word that we'd heard of but didn't know anything about and uh, so we were lucky to get our meeting on which which helped enormously uh, with our funds but obviously as the year went by um there was no speedway and so therefore we lost out on our track collections 
But having said that, riders weren't getting injured like they would do normally. Um, so as the year went by, we did some fundraising um, with uh, the BSPA quiz night and various other activities with Kyle Howarth on, on his cycle ride and Jetendra Duffel on, on his walk. And so we, we got, we had money raised from other sources, which we wouldn't perhaps ordinarily have had. Um, but at the end of the year, we, we finished off reasonably okay, um, despite the fact we didn't have to track collections. The, the, the Speedway public were extremely generous during the lockdown period and they understood that we didn't have an income coming in and uh, it, to full credit to everybody that they responded magnificently. And give us an idea of the costs that are required to keep the Speedway Riders Benevolent Fund in business for an average year. What are the sort of figures that you, you need to raise to keep going? But we re, we need roughly on average about a hundred, a hundred and twenty thousand pounds each year. That's that's pretty much what we pay out on an average season. Uh, we could have a few blips where we have a, a few more serious accidents, and and so therefore we pay a little bit more. But an average would be about a hundred and twenty thousand pounds. And the money that you give to riders, that's there to cover the general cost of living, their bills, or uh, also some rehabilitation costs, medical treatment, or a, a bit of a mixture of, of all of those kind of things, that, the cost that will be associated with an accident. It's, it's a mixture of all those things. It depends. Every rider is it's individual, and uh, every rider has his own personal um, commitments and and various other things so we look at each case separately and we try and work out what is best for each individual rider whether it be we plug the mortgage uh, repayments for a period of time whether his wife needs some assistance or it's a whole range of things and uh, we kind of tailor make it to suit each individual rider and your involvement in Speedway, you will have overseen um, a number of crashes through you know, your career uh, being in the referee's box and, and presiding over these meetings. What, what was your journey from, from the referee's box to, uh, to the, the Benevolent Fund? Um, well, basically, I, I retired from refereeing and Bernard Crapper, who was uh, the promoter at Oxford Speedway and also he was the secretary of the Benevolent Fund, Bernard and I had had a few clashes during uh, my refereeing career and his promoting and team managing career. And I'd like to think that, that Bernard got his own back on me by, <laughs> by saying, Paul, would you like to get involved in the Benevolent Fund? It'll only take you a couple of hours a week and you'd better do it very easily. And he, he quickly persuaded me to get involved and, um, and then I think he went away laughing, saying, I've now got my own back. Um, <laughs> but, right. but Bernard, he, he was beginning to suffer ill health. And, um, and so, it, you know, he needed somebody to replace himself. And, uh, you know, I feel very privileged that, that he considered myself to try and get involved at that point. As we mentioned, fundraising, a key part of any charity, and the Speedway Riders Benevolent Fund is no different. Uh, One person who's raising some money this year for the Ben Fund is Roddy McDougall. Now, Roddy worked as a journalist for several national news broadcasters, a producer and reporter for BBC News and BBC TV Sport. He moved on to senior roles in news editing with TVAM, GMTV and ITN, and he was head of home news there. And um, he's written a couple of books um, but his latest is called No Breaks which looks at a lost season in British Speedway and a story of survival. Um, Roddy joins us now. Roddy where did your relationship with Speedway come into your life? Um, Ian I'm probably very much like you. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a fan 
first and foremost, I've never sat on a speedway bike and I have huge, huge respect for people like Mitch and all the other riders who do. I mean, for us, it's, it's an entertainment. For them, as you said in your introduction, it can be unfortunately life-changing. Um, I've been a fan. Uh, I'm now in London, so you know it's sometimes quite difficult to actually get out and see live speedway. Obviously, London's certainly not the place it, it was, but I've always had a love for the sport. And uh, my idea was to write a book uh, and make my royalties available to the Ben Fund uh, which seemed to be a good thing to do because I think it's a terrific uh, charity. Uh, and I think Paul Aykroyd and the, and the trustees do a, do a great job. And in, in your book, really, you're, you're covering the, well, the change of Speedway, I suppose. Speedway, of course, was uh, a, a massive sport. Some stadiums had, you know, maybe 40, 50, even more thousand in the 1950s, 1960s and so on. It was the sport after football, really, in this country. But obviously, since then, things have changed and there's many reasons for that. But that's what the, the book covers uh, largely, isn't it? It is. It's a sort of mix of two, really. I mean, it's, it sort of runs from... September 2019, so it opens with the sad closure of Stoke uh, and then ends in October 2020 uh, last year. It's amazing how, since I've written it and, and, and sort of mentioned it to people, the number of people of my age, and obviously I'm a, a bit older than, uh, than, than, than you and Mitch, who have said, oh, Speedway, is that still going? I used to go to Reading, <laughs> or I used to go to Ellesmere Port, or I used to go to Boston. And they want to know if it's still on. And I think it's a huge shame that in a large way, Speedway has sort of dropped out of national consciousness. And what I wanted to do with the book was basically to do two things. One was to raise some money for the Ben Fund, but also to, in a sense, try, um, if I could sort of bang the drum for Speedway, sort of beyond the Speedway world and tell people, look, this is a this is a sport that's still around. And on its day for me, I think it's the most exciting sport there is. Speedway, of course, is is going through a bit of a, a change now. I think with the um, it'd be interesting to see how the new TV deal goes with with Eurosport because they're going to be making it free to air um, on Quest as well with a highlights package. And uh, of course, they're taking over running the the Speedway Grand Prix as well, which I think can only be a positive thing. But I think we are still quite a long way behind those uh, those days of say the nineteen fifties to the nineteen seventies when it was you know one of the functions to to attend through the course of the summer. Absolutely. And it was interesting, you know, listening to, to Phil Lanning last week talking about it from a media perspective. You know, I, I don't work uh, in, in television or, or in news anymore. But, you know, two ways for me that I think that Speedway could get a boost. Um, I mean, uh, the British team last won, I think it was as England, in fact, the last one, the, the World Team Cup in 1989, which is getting on for 32 years ago. Um, obviously, we all had far bigger things to worry about last year. But I think one of the, the sad things about the Speedway season was the fact that we didn't get to host the Speedway of Nations at Bellevue. You know, had it gone ahead at the time, had Ty Wolfenden, had Robert Lambert, had Dan Bewley been there, then I think Britain would have stood a really good chance. And I think there is the possibility that uh, it could have got a really good publicity boost from that. The other thing, which I think is important and, and could again give the sport a boost, you only need to look at the likes of, of Fallon Sherrock in darts or Rachel Blackmore in horse racing winning the Grand National or Sharon Shannon Courtney in boxing. If there was a woman, a, a woman or several women who could make an impact in Speedway, again, that's the sort of thing that's new and different and could just give the, support, the sport some much needed publicity. Well, we've certainly got Katie Gordon, and uh, I know there's one or two others in the system as well. So over the years, we'll uh, we'll see how that uh, prediction pans out. This is Humans of Speedway. We're talking about the Speedway Riders Benevolent Fund. I'm joined by Paul Aykroyd, the chair of the Ben Fund. Uh, that was the voice of Roddy McDougall that you heard there, who's uh, had a long career in media, and he's uh, recently written a book called No Breaks, talking about the fortunes of British Speedway. And Mitchell Davy is also with me as well, who's a rider who was riding for the Birmingham Brummies at the time of a huge crash that he had in 2018 and he's going to be raising some money for the Ben Fund he'll tell you about that next here on Humans of Speedway
Welcome back to Humans of Speedway. I'm Ian Brannan, and in this episode, we're looking at Speedway's only charity for injured riders, the Speedway Riders Benevolent Fund charity, which helps out any rider who's racing for a British club at the time of an accident and requires their support if they're going to be out for a prolonged period of time or suffering from life-changing injuries. And um, it all relies on fundraising, of course, and a lot of that money comes in through uh, things like the Ben Fund Bonanza meeting that's held every year, bucket collections around stadiums, but also individuals doing their own thing as well. And Mitchell Davey is one of those who's going to be raising money later on this year. He's going to be doing a sponsored bike ride across Scotland. And, uh, well, he can tell us all about it in his own words. Mitch, what are you up to? You're back on a bike again, but uh, you're you're providing the power this time. Yeah, I've, I've been thinking, you know, since I got injured, how can I repay, you know, the people that helped me out? Um, and, you know, Ben Fund's one of those at the top of the list. So I've, I've been thinking, you know, how, what can I do? How can I do something? Um, obviously, Lee Kilby done a, done a head shave last year to raise money for the Ben Fund. And I jumped in on that just to, to try and help. Um, but then I, at the same time, I was like, I need my own idea. Um, and yeah, so... I was out walking my dogs one day and just decided that, you know, I want to get fit again this summer. I want to, you know, get myself back into a, a really good shape. So I was like, well, I've ridden for Glasgow, Edinburgh and Berwick. Why don't I, I cycle from, you know, a, to all three tracks essentially in a day. And uh, yeah, we're doing, doing it on a mountain bike to, to make it that little bit different and that little bit harder rather than a, a road cycle perhaps. Yeah, and you've done some training rides already, and I know you're out at the weekend. Um, how, how is it feeling being uh, being back out on any kind of bike, though? Ah, it's good. I, you know, it's something that you never lose the love for. Um, it's it's definitely not as fast as a speedway bike or get the adrenaline going as much. But yeah, we, you know, being on the mountain bike at the same time, I can have fun. You know, I can do a wheelie, I can do a jump if if there's one around. Um, yeah, to to get a little bit of a a buzz, I guess. Um, but yeah, that's what. Um, so far, so far, so good. Um, training's going all right. We're just gradually building up the the miles to you know make sure the body can make it and um, yeah, make sure we uh, don't fatigue too much and uh, able to stand up at the end of it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And so, what's the date and when can people um, and where can people find out more and, and sponsor you? Most importantly, because obviously that's the big thing. Yeah, that's what um, the we're going for the tenth of July, I think it is. Um, the Edinburgh are at Berwick that night, so it's it's a good time. You know, um, it's all the all the links are available like on all my social media pages like Instagram, Twitter, and uh, Facebook. Um, but you know, alternatively, um, the big big thing is um, you can donate directly to the Ben Fund via text message these days, or or via PayPal. Um, for people who don't like using the, um, I guess the fundraising websites. Um, so I think I think the text number is seven double zero eight five, um, and it, I, I think you just te- text SRBF and it donates five pounds straight from your account. It's you know simple and easy to do, and at the end of the day, it it all goes to a really worthy cause. Although there was no speedway, they're still paying out to riders who have been, you know, permanently injured um, and couldn't weren't able to return to work. So, you know, their funds are still going out. So, yeah, they needed something because they didn't get all the, you know, the fundraising that they get on a year to year basis normally. So, um, yeah, that's what the. I guess at the time you don't realize how much money is raised by the riders going out and collect collecting, you know, with the buckets during those meetings. Uh, it's, it's huge. Um, and you know, you think about how many tracks are across the UK, it's, it all adds up and, uh, yeah, it's, it's funds that the Ben fund need to, to support us riders. And, and Roddy, for you, uh, you've um, chosen the, the Ben Fund um, to raise money with with your book. What was the decision to to, to support the Ben Fund in particular? Um, I just think I, I think it's the only thing I'm right in saying it. Uh, it's, it's the only Speedway Riders uh, charity set up for uh, injured riders like like Mitch uh, to help them. It just sounded like a really really good cause, and for a sport that's you know given me uh, a lot of hours 
of pleasure over the years. Um, as I said, I've always wanted to write about Speedway. Um, it just seemed like a just seemed like the natural thing to do, really. Um, and actually, Paul Aykroyd uh, was one of the first people I contacted, uh, and was like most people. Uh, who I spoke to during the course of the book, you know, whether it was Rob Godfrey or Jitendra Duffel or Tom Bacon or Josh Otte, you know, they were just really happy to give their time, even during, uh, you know, 2020 when it was a, when it was a tough time with the pandemic. And and what's your uh, what's the reaction been so far to the book? Because um, you know you, you you've you've got no uh, no reason to to hold back in any way or or anything like that. I mean, it is a, a fairly honest account of where Speedway's at at the moment. That's right. Well, um, Peter Oakes gave it a very nice review in, in Speedway Star, um, and I managed to uh, get some coverage uh, in, of all places, The Spectator, uh, <laughs> yes. which I think uh, was, was supposed to be the first time it had ever mentioned Speedway. In a sense, that, that's what I've been trying to do, and I'm still, I'm still trying to do it, is just to sort of get people to realise that Speedway is around. Now, you know, obviously uh, you've got to give a fairly realistic position of the sport you can't go in and say the garden's rosy but you know while sort of talking about how speedway has declined in popularity over the last 40 years hopefully you know there was an invitation to click on a youtube link and watch the the waffenden schmars lindgren race in october last year um you know we talked about sport with a heart and when you when you compare that with what's been happening with with top level football over the last few weeks um, you know, Speedway has a great community. Uh, when injured, when riders are injured, it's not just the Ben Fund collections at the track. It really, really does have a heart. And Mitch, what's um, twenty twenty one have in store for you? I think you mentioned that you're uh, you're going to be working with with Craig Cook uh, a little bit because uh, you, you say you, you're still maybe standing away from from riding the bike yourself, but you still got a little bit of involvement around the sport now and again. Yeah, that's it. I got a full time job now, so. I said to Craig, you know, I'm I'm more than happy to help out at the sort of, you know, the Northern Tracks guys going in Riberic, um, Newcastle, sort of anything on a weekend. Um, that that's my my level of involvement at the moment. But you know, I I keep toying with the idea of maybe if there's a individual or something like that, I'm I may stick my hand up for it and have have a play again and and see how it goes. Uh, you mentioned as well that you have been back on a bike since your accident, just not competitively uh, in the league or, or in, a, in a team meeting, but you have been out there on the bike again. Yeah, I had a practice last year at, uh, at Redcar I, I, when when sort of things opened up a little bit, you know. Um, I hired the track one day, um, myself and, and a whole heap of boys went and uh, had a practice and, you know, I loved it. I, I put together a, a small YouTube video um, just sort of showing different angles of, you know, of a speedway bike. Um, and just, just trying to, I, I guess, like Roddy sort of gay, you know, get people interested, give them something different, you know, to try and raise the profile of the sport. I'd, I'd love to, you know, make more videos than that, um, you know, of, of things people want to see or, or that, you know, and, give them a bit more insight i think you know we're in a world full of social media and everything like that now so to to publicize the sport to get you know more people coming back through the gate and bums on seats i guess as we say that that you know the, the danger of the sport is one of its attractions as well and clearly you probably don't share that view quite so much but uh, you know that's that is one of the one of the attractions for the spectators but i think for spectators they have to bear in mind you know that they are you are actually humans at the end of the day riding these bikes and uh, you know you are quite you know really putting your life on the line for for their entertainment yeah that's it but I think that's that's part of the reason why why riders do it at the same time you know it's 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 a you know an, an adrenaline buzz for us it's you know you'll never find anything that replaces the the feeling of of being on a speedway bike i guess in a way it's it's like people skydiving it's like people you know you know if they take it to real extremes base jumping and things like that you know everyone's got their own thing but yeah, it's it's an unbelievable feeling when you when you're racing a speedway bike, and obviously everything goes to plan, and you know you might win a race or something that just tops tops things off. 
And for you, Paul, just to round things off, um, we're on the cusp of a brand new season. Speedway getting back up and running in uh, in the UK once again at the time of recording. We're a few days away. Uh, but for you, you're ready to leap into action because unfortunately there will be riders, possibly even riders listening to this who don't know it yet, but may well need the help of the Speedway Riders Benevolent Fund. And, and when they do, you'll be there. Yes, indeed. I only said to my wife today, we need to be geared up next week. We start next Monday and um, sort of pencil sharpened and, you know, we're ready to kick in uh, as soon as anything untoward happens. Hopefully nothing untoward will happen, but um, rarely do we go through a season where that occurs. But uh, my thanks to Paul Ackroyd, the chairman of the Speedway Riders Benevolent Fund, to Mitchell Davey, who's going to be raising money for the Ben Fund. After all that support he's had from him, he wants to do something and pay something back. And also my thanks to Roddy McDougall. And you can get your hands on Roddy's book as well called No Breaks, A Lost Season in British Speedway. It's out now. and uh, the RRP is at 19.99, but you can find it in uh, all good bookstores and you can get it online as well. So keep your eyes out for that because it's a good read. And if you'd like to make a donation to the Speedway Riders Benevolent Fund, there are plenty of ways that you can do it. As Mitchell mentioned earlier, you can donate by text, probably the easiest way to do it. You can get your phone, type in SRBF and text to 70085 and that will donate £5 straight away to the Speedway Riders Benevolent Fund. You can also donate via PayPal. The details are online at srbf.co.uk and you can donate by cheque as well. You can even leave a legacy in your will if you wish. All the details online at the Speedway Riders Benevolent Fund website srbf.co.uk for all the info. And hopefully as we go through the season, club collections, shared events, all these kind of things that help raise money for the Speedway Riders Benevolent Fund will return and uh, those funds will continue to increase to do the amazing work that the Ben Fund does and you've heard just how important it is to every rider because of course no rider knows when they're going to need the help and that help from the Ben Fund could be very long lasting indeed and certainly they will be there for any rider racing for a British club through the course of this and uh, subsequent seasons as well. Don't forget, check out some of our previous episodes. If you're new to Humans of Speedway, there's lots to listen to. Uh, Recent episodes include with Nikolai Clint. And uh, in that, of course, we're talking about how he would be racing for Ipswich. Well, that's not happening now, but there's still plenty in there. And he does give an insight into just how much it costs to be an international speedway rider. And perhaps some of those are uh, the factors involved in uh, in the decision that's been made there. Who knows? Uh, Also spoke to Paco Castagna and... uh, a recent episode too with Bellevue legend Chris Morton. Just a few of the episodes that you should check out. And we are part of the Sports Social Podcast Network. And another podcast that I am proud to host is the official podcast of British Speedway. Lots to check out there and we're just getting ready for the season as we head through the season. Join us every Tuesday. We'll have all the reaction from the Monday night fixtures. We'll have interviews with some of those involved at those matches on the Monday night. And of course we'll be looking ahead to the upcoming action for the week ahead as well don't miss it every tuesday no breaks no fear part of the sports social podcast network and we will see you next time on humans of speedway this podcast is part of the sports social podcast network sports social podcast network Looking for a fun way to win up to 25 times your money this basketball season? Test your skills on Prize Picks, the most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Just select two or more players, pick more or less on their projection for a wide variety of stats, and place your entry. It's as easy as that. If you have the skills, you can turn $10 into $250 with just a few taps. Easy gameplay, quick withdrawals, and injury insurance on your picks are what make Prize Picks the number one daily fantasy sports app. Ready to test your skills? Join the Prize Picks community of more than 7 million players who have already signed up. Right now, Prize Picks will match your first deposit up to $100. Just visit prizepicks.com slash get100 and use code get100. That's code get100 at prizepicks.com slash get100. For a first deposit matchup to $100. Prize Picks, daily fantasy sports made easy.